Has this $500 machine with an impressive set of features redefined our expectations from entry-level espresso machines? Or is it more like my parents described me, a disappointment? The Chinese brand DF pretty much flipped the coffee grinder market on its head with products like the DF64 and 83. You can check out our review linked up here. They even just announced the DF54 at $299, so it's no surprise that they've decided to cast a wider net and stir some shit up in other segments, like espresso machines. This is their first product that's not a grinder, and it's pretty wild how much they've packed into it at this price point. I will dive deep into the features that this thing offers. We'll look at how it performs in various scenarios, compare it to similarly priced machines like the Flare 58 and Gadget Classic Pro, and share some really useful workflow tips. But first, let's judge it purely based on its looks. Now, before we get started, Luke from Me Coffee sent us this machine to test and review. No money exchange hands. They've had no say in what we've put in this video and they don't get to watch it before any of you do. A huge thanks to Benki Brewing Tools for helping us import this machine. If you're looking to buy coffee gear, then use the link in the description below to get a 5% discount. It also helps the channel. And lastly, thank you to Blue Tokai Coffee Roasters for sending us a bunch of delicious coffee to test this machine out. Okay, so I would guess that the majority of people who buy this machine aren't gonna be buying it for its looks. The feature set is definitely the biggest draw, but it honestly looks kinda cute and nondescript. Now, while I do prefer the styling and attention to detail on something like the Gadget Classic Pro, this machine is very neutral and minimal, so it really doesn't draw too much attention to itself, and I think that's a positive. The brushed stainless steel looks quite nice, the buttons are small and functional, and the display is fine. Although, I find it hilarious that the plus is on the left-hand side and the minus on the right. Classic DF move. The water tank is nice and slim and tucks away neatly at the back of the machine. The one thing that really sticks out though is this giant sized mole. It's just missing a few strands of hair. I'm not entirely sure why it needed to be this bulbous and it's definitely a standout feature in that it really stands out like a sore thumb. Actually, it just stands out like a mole. The other minor complaint would be the color temperature of this light. It's a bit tube lighty. I would have liked it to be a tad warmer and it would also be nice to be able to turn it off when I wanted to. Filming B-roll for this video and balancing the colors was quite a pain in the ass, but that's just a YouTuber problem, so it shouldn't bother most of you too much. Now, there's one last thing that bothers me and it bothers me more than I'd like to admit. I blame my designer brain for this. Check this out. Yeah, the logo. Do you see it? Or am I the only one anal enough to notice this? Come on. It's not centered and I get annoyed every time I see it. If you've been using this machine blissfully unaware of this error, you're welcome. So while the Apex isn't winning any espresso machine pageants anytime soon, it isn't bad looking at all. Okay, let's move on to the build quality. And for the price, it's pretty decent. The main chassis is quite sturdy, which is nice, although the machine rocks. Yeah, not that kind of rocking. This kind and it's pretty damn annoying, but nothing a little folded paper can't fix. The water tank is pretty decent, except for the lid, which feels really cheap and flimsy. And this part, which seems like a handle, pops off every now and then, which is very unnerving, so I would just handle it using the main body instead. The buttons aren't bad, but they are plastic and feel a little cheap, which isn't surprising. I just hope they hold up well over time being used and exposed to heat. The display is nice and bright, the steam one is alright, the giant mole above it feels a bit cheap, and it jiggles when it's opened. Sorry, that's kind of gross. The portafilter feels solid and I love that it's 58mm, which is industry standard. No real complaints here. The basket that comes with it is okay, but I would upgrade to a precision one if possible. Just remember that this portafilter can't take very deep baskets. Most 18 gram ones should work, but if you need a larger one, then I would check before I buy it. Or just get a bottomless portafilter. The other accessories are not great. And I'd be shocked if they were, because... The free accessories on many far more expensive machines are garbage. The tamper doesn't really fit well, single baskets like this are a bit of a nightmare to use, and this delightful plastic scoop and brush, I just won't waste my time or yours talking about them. And yes, I have indeed saved the best for last. The drip tray. Magical. This work of art weighs about as much as a dose of coffee and is more fragile than the male ego. It's like they started production and realized that they'd forgotten the drip tray entirely 
and then threw one in for free because they couldn't increase the price at that point. It also really needs some sort of lock because it slides out so damn easily. Try to wipe it down, it slides. Place a cup on it, it slides. Turn a damn grinder on that vibrates a little, it slides. But you know what? With the amount of stuff they've packed into this machine, I think I let this one slide. Sorry, I had to. The drip tray cover is actually all metal and feels really solid, so it's even more of a shock to the system when you take it off and encounter this. I just wish it had more cutouts because water splashes everywhere when it hits this thing. The drip tray capacity is not bad at all and this little float indicator is quite useful. So yeah, that's everything on the outside but I do want to quickly show you how things look under the hood before we move on. So peeking on the inside, we can see that it's pretty clean and quite organized. Of course, you don't see any copper tubing or braided pipes at this price point, but I was pleasantly surprised to see a lot of brass fittings. Here's the stainless steel boiler right above the group head and off to the side essentially the second boiler or thermal block dedicated to steam duties and you'll see in a bit why having this is such a big deal. So yeah, overall while the tolerances aren't great and there are parts that wobble and feel flimsy, the build quality is honestly better than I expected. Okay, let's run through the features for a second before we look at how this thing performs because it's kind of impressive. So check this out. For $500, you get PID control, a display, a pressure gauge, metal build, a standard 58mm portafilter, a 550mm stainless steel boiler, a dedicated thermal block for steaming, which is kind of like a four dual boiler, a decent size 1.7 liter water tank, programmable pre-infusion, well, sort of, Slayer style flow control, not really, but there is flow control, a fast warm up, a short and steam timer, and lastly, two brewing modes, manual and automatic. Okay, these aren't bifocals, but this list deserved a bit of extra drama. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's a pretty baller list of features and is why I really wanted to test and review this machine. Okay, let's talk about brewing and how one would operate this machine. It's really quite simple. Basically, you have three buttons on the left and a display on the right with two touch buttons on it. The top button turns the machine on and off. The middle button is the manual shot. You press the button once to start the shot and then again to stop it. Simple. And to be honest, it's the only mode that I use. The other is auto which brews for a fixed duration. So you can program it by holding the button down for as long as you want the shot to run, say 30 seconds and then letting it go. Then the next time you press it, it'll auto stop after 30 seconds. Holding down the plus button on the display is how you set the boiler temperature. If you remember, I mentioned pre-infusion during my sophisticated read through of the specs. And yes, this machine has it, but no, you shouldn't use it. And I'll explain why in a second. If you do decide to use it, then note that it only works in the auto mode. To program the pre-infusion, you can long press the manual shot button to set how long you want the pump to be engaged for. You can then press and hold the minus button to set how long you want it to wait before it starts pulling the shot. So yeah, that's about it when it comes to operating this machine. So let's brew some espresso, then look at the UX and how this thing performs. All right, let's turn this machine on and I'm gonna take the portafilter. filter. I will prep this off camera and be back in a minute. All right, I'm back. Let's see how this goes. Get some scales. Much exactly nine bars. Awesome, that's 18 grams in and 42 out in about 22 seconds. This is the unifilter, so these shots run a bit faster. But let's taste this. I'm quite excited. That is a nice shot of espresso and the machine is pretty quiet for a vibration pump machine. It also helps that I'm using really good coffee. This is from the MS Estate in Chikmanglo roasted by Blue Tokai Coffee Roasters. It's a mix of SL795 and an Ethiopian heirloom varietal that they planted a few years ago. I would say it's on the lighter side of medium and I absolutely love it on espresso. If you're interested, I've linked to the coffee in the description below. So straight off the bat, I'll say I'm really impressed with this machine. It boasts a feature set that eliminates a lot of the frustrations that come with owning a budget espresso machine, 
But it's not all rosy, so let's pick this thing apart and see what works and what doesn't. Let's start with the good. The heat up time is quick, like under 5 minutes for the display to read the desired temperature. And if you're brewing something more developed, then you could get away brewing at the 7 to 10 minute mark. But ideally, I'd wait for 15 minutes and you're good to go. Staying on the topic of temperature, this thing has a PID and is pretty damn stable. We weren't able to get our hands on a SCASE device in time, so we did some Jugaad, which is Indian for MacGyvering or DIY. Now, there will obviously be an offset between the probe temperature and what we're seeing on the Apex display, but this was more to test stability and it performed very well over multiple 30 to 35 second windows. Temperature surfing was kind of a given at this price point and even on machines a lot more expensive to be honest, so not having to worry about it here is huge. Not only that, it also bounces back up to temperature really quickly after pulling a shot. Considering how important it is to have good temperature stability for espresso, this just makes life so much easier by eliminating a lot of the guesswork, frustration and inconsistency that typically comes with machines in this price bracket. Now, one quirk that I have found with this PID temperature display is that when the machine is turned on, it displays the boiler temperature, which then slowly rises until it reaches the set temperature. Say we set it to 96, if I then change the target temperature to 90, the display just continues to read 90 instead of going back to 96 and then slowly coming down as the water cools. The same issue if I increase the temperature. If I go from 96 to say 100, the display just stays at 100. And at this point, I have no idea what the boiler temperature is. This seems to be a minor display bug, but it's very frustrating. Now, coming back to pre-infusion, on the first iteration of this machine, kind of looked like this. Yep. A one second piddle that just wet the top of the puck followed by a user set wait time. This is not pre-infusion and will actually impact your shot negatively. The pre-infusion on this machine has been updated and I was very excited about it until I realized it had a fatal flaw. Like I mentioned earlier, you can now set how long you want the pump to be engaged during pre-infusion instead of it just being fixed at one second. This is a huge step in the right direction, but when the pre-infusion ends, it unfortunately switches the solenoid instead of just ramping down or cutting the pump. And this, in most cases, will cause enough suction to unseat the puck and ruin your shot. I spoke to Luke from Me Coffee about this, and he said they're aware of the issue, but the fix is not simple, so I guess we'll just have to wait a little longer for this feature to be implemented properly. If you do want to test this feature out, then note that it only works in the auto mode, but you can very easily mimic the same behavior by just hitting the manual brew button, waiting for the first few drops, and then pressing it again. Then wait as long as you want, and then once you're ready to start the actual pull, press the button again. But for now, I would say don't bother with the pre-infusion. Luckily, the ramp up is gentle enough to produce really good results even without it. Next, let's address the elephant in the room. Something that's been talked about a lot on forums and by reviewers. No, this machine does not have an overpressure valve and I do think it's a rather odd design decision. For those of you who don't know, an OPV helps prevent the pump from exceeding a set pressure by bleeding any excess out. So if you have it set to 9 bars, then no matter how much resistance the puck offers, 9 bar will be the ceiling. The lack of an OPV means that if you grind too fine, it will hit pressures well over 9 bars and you may have noticed this on your machine with the gauge going all the way up to 15 or 16 bars even. This isn't ideal, but there are two reasons why it isn't such a big deal here. One is that the pump has a very gentle ramp up to pressure and a slow ramp down as the puck degrades. So even shots where the pressure is peaked over 9 bars haven't been terrible. The other most significant reason is this little screw here. This is your not so slayer style needle valve or flow controller, which basically allows you to set the water debit anywhere from zero all the way to around seven mils per second. Turning it clockwise slows the flow down and going the other way speeds it up. Straight out the box, this was set to around six mils per second and I've had really good results lowering it down to around 4.5 to five mils per second and then adjusting the grind size so that the shots peak at around nine bars. This combined with the gentle pressure delivery has produced some excellent shots of espresso. I should mention though that I've just started playing with the Weber Workshop's Unifilter and that does tend to prefer a slightly higher water debit. So do I miss having an OPV? Well, yes, it's just nice to be able to set that and forget it. And I do think it'll be added to future iterations of this machine. So should you hold off buying this machine because of the lack of an OPV? Absolutely not. The ability to control the water debit makes the lack of an OPV more of a minor annoyance rather than a deal breaker in my opinion. Also, while flow control is more of a set and then brew kind of feature that's been crudely implemented at this point, I just think it's a matter of time before someone on Etsy or DF themselves add a paddle to this thing so we can have some real fun with this machine. 
The screw needs several rotations to go from closed to full water debit, so it just isn't practical to use it while brewing at this point. You would need some sort of a step up gear system to utilize the entire range of the screw as the paddle moves through a range of 180 degrees. Anyway, let's move on. All right, let's talk about steaming milk because it's pretty exciting. Now, if you remember, I said that having a thermoblock is kind of like having a dual boiler, so some of you may be wondering if it's possible to brew and steam at the same time. Unfortunately, not. But that's okay, because there's pretty much no wait time for the steam to come up to temperature, or then waiting or flushing to drop the temperature back down for brewing. It's so much simpler. The only thing I'd recommend is to purge it for like 5 seconds before steaming to get rid of any condensation and also allow the steam pressure to get up to max power. While you do lose a little bit of power with the thermoblock design, the steam capabilities on this machine are more than adequate to get silky milk and do whatever latte art your talent allows. And to be honest, the fact that it does take a little longer means that it's great for beginners too. The wand is kinda small and a bit awkward to position but does the job. Wow, that sounded dirty. All right, we've covered a lot of ground in this review, so I think it's a good time to look at who this machine is for and also do some comparisons. So the obvious competition would of course be the beloved Gasha Classic Pro. And here, for me, the Apex wins on pretty much every count other than design, build, and as things stand today, mods. But the Gasha Classic Pro has pedigree. The brand's history is deeply intertwined with coffee history, especially espresso history. It's a brand that's gained trust and reputation over the years. You get Italian design and a quality product with good support and a massive community of enthusiasts who can help you troubleshoot or mod the machine. So if you value all of these things, then you should probably skip the Apex. If, however, you don't give a shit about legacy or who makes this machine, or what you can expect in terms of longevity, then the Apex is very, very hard to beat. The other interesting comparison would be the Flare 58, which is very similarly priced, and we got a lot of questions about this. Basically, they excel at different things, so if you figure out what's important to you, then it's a pretty easy decision. If you care more about speed, workflow, and convenience, then the Apex wins, especially if you make milk-based drinks. No matter how much you streamline the workflow with a Flare or any manual machine for that matter, it's just not going to be as straightforward and quick as a semi-automatic. On the other hand, you're going to have to spend a lot more money on a semi-automatic if you want the kind of control that the Flare offers you. If you know what you're doing, you can pull most any profile on the Flare 58 other than very long ratios like an Allongé. So with everything that the Apex offers at 500 US dollars, it's hard not to recommend it. But before you pull the plug, just note that longevity of this machine and how well it'll hold up over time is unknown at this point. And depending on where you live, the support and service may not be as convenient or as good as more mature brands. And lastly, I'm not sure how readily available spare parts are for this machine. So yeah, that's the Me Coffee Apex. And while it has a bunch of quirks and annoyances, it punches well above its price. And that's going to force a lot of other brands to innovate to be able to compete at this price point. If the DF Grinder lineup is any indication of where things are headed, this machine is only going to get better. And I'm sure we'll also see a more premium and refined version at some point soon, similar to what we saw with the DF64V and 83V models. But now, I'd really love to hear from all of you. What are your thoughts on this machine? Would you buy it? And do you have any other questions? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thank you so much for watching and brew our arms